Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. I think, Stacy, I, I hadn't really felt that much pressure until you sort of described the weight of the world on my uh, shoulders uh, in sharing this initiative. But, but it is a very exciting initiative, and it's very exciting to be here. Uh, as as Stacy said, I think you guys are are part of the choir for a lot of the message that I bring, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to to be here. Uh, and I'll I'll talk. Uh, uh, for just a few minutes about the project uh, itself, its, its history, its structure, uh, and then talk mostly about what the substance is and what you can expect from Family Medicine for America's Health over the next five years of this initiative, and very much talk about your opportunity for, for input and how, how this is uh, intended to work on, on your behalf. So uh, I will get moving. Uh, if, on that app, first of all, I love that app. I already took a couple of pictures of Dan while he was standing up here, and I took a picture of y'all from up here, too. So go to the photo gallery and take a look. So, um, so Family Medicine for America's Health grew out of a, an initiative uh, over the last 18, 24 months to, to do a follow-up uh, look back on the original Future of Family Medicine project. Uh, it published its report in April of 2004, and it was felt, you know, 10 years is a good time to look back, see, you know, what progress have we made? How's the environment changed? How do we redirect our course going forward? Not to redo all of that work in any way, but simply to reevaluate where we are and where we want to go from there. Uh, and so that was the idea behind that, and it was felt that this was a good time uh, to launch an initiative that would then follow up on that original, uh, really landmark work. So these are the eight family medicine organizations that meet twice a year. We refer to them as the working party. Uh, until I was an AFP officer, I didn't really know what the working party was. But the idea has been for, for, for a number of years, 20 years or more, that these groups get together and talk about what they're working on uh, to make sure that there's no work at cross purposes, there's no unnecessary duplication of effort, that there's not areas of, uh, of important work that are being overlooked unintentionally because this group thinks that that group is doing it. Uh, but they, they get together and, and really uh, work towards common goals uh, related to family medicine and primary care. Uh, and so these are the eight sponsoring organizations of Family Medicine for America's Health. These are the funders of what Stacy referred to. Uh, these organizations have dug deep into their reserves and, uh, uh, and funded this effort with, uh, with roughly $20 million. Uh, and I'll talk about what that's going to go towards. But uh, obviously a big effort on, be uh, on behalf of our specialty. I also want to stop and talk about for a second that this isn't just about family medicine. So if you're not a family physician, I don't want you to get up and leave. This is really about family medicine taking a leadership role within the primary care community and in the broader sense within the healthcare system to be a change agent, to really to change our healthcare system in the way that all of you know that it needs to be, that it needs to be based on a solid primary care foundation if we have any interest uh, in truly achieving health in our population. Uh, and this effort is very much focused on that. Uh, at the end of the day, if you put down in a single line what's the, what's the mission of this project, it's to achieve the triple aim, you know, improving health, improving health care, and, and uh, restraining the uh, really ungodly escalation of cost of our healthcare system. And I would argue that you cannot do that without a solid primary care foundation. And that's where the alignment is between that triple aim effort that is really a tectonic movement within healthcare and what really is going to advance the, uh, the interests of, of uh, family medicine and primary care in general. So these next few slides are things that you've all uh, been very familiar with. They're just part of the standard slide deck that I show about how, you know, how our healthcare system is really not functioning in the way that we want it to, that it's really not built on a foundation of primary care, that it's not really uh, aligned with achieving the goal of health, and that we spend at least 50% more than any first world country on health, and yet by any measure, the health of our population doesn't measure up against those other countries. Uh, we spend um, uh, an inadequate amount, I'll be polite, an inadequate amount on prevention and wellness and health promotion and public health uh, to, uh, to, to improve the health of our people. And on the back end, therefore, we spend a lot of dollars in salvage care, in late illness care that's expensive, that doesn't really bring the health outcomes that we're looking for. 
I'm always embarrassed. This slide was made for me. I don't think as individual practitioners for a moment that any of you have lost your focus on patients and that they're not foremost in your mind, but our healthcare system is definitely not patient focused and is not centered on achieving their wellness. And, and we as primary care practitioners who are really focused on, on a patient-centered healthcare system really need to, again, be that change agent in the broader healthcare system. So again, uh, family medicine leading the charge. There was quite a bit of discussion early on. Should this just be the family medicine organization? Should it include the broader primary care community? Um, and we could have probably spent a lot of effort trying to bring together a, broader, a, a bigger coalition, uh, uh, but it would have taken a lot more time and effort. And really what we'd like to do is, is get to work. So we brought this group together, and yet we very much want to collaborate uh, on areas of mutual interest with our colleagues in other medical specialties, in other healthcare disciplines, uh, very much uh, with the payer and employer and communities. Uh, uh, those are all of our stakeholder uh, groups with whom we have alliance to, to work going forward. But again, this idea uh, of the triple aim, very much at the, at the core of our efforts. So this strategic planning effort that occurred in the creation of Family Medicine for America's Health was really to create a strategic plan for the specialty of family medicine, each of those eight organizations uh, also working in their strategic planning efforts to, to align with this more global mission. Uh, each of those eight organizations identified a member uh, to serve on the board of directors uh, for Family Medicine for America's Health. Uh, I'm the AFP's representative to that board and then was selected to be chair. So each of those eight organizations has a representative, but we felt that wasn't inclusive enough and that we really needed uh, broader representation. So we added uh, a, a, an early career family physician because we very much wanted this to also reflect the, the true future that we're working towards and, and our younger colleagues really are the folks that are going to practice practice in this system longer than, than folks of my generation in family medicine. Um, in the AFP world and reaching out to the, the boots on the ground that uh, Stacy referred to, our, our AFP chapters are very integral to, to coordinating those state and regional efforts. And so we have a, uh, a state chapter uh, executive on our board of directors. Uh, uh, we, uh, I always forget one person. Um, Oh yeah, we needed a full scope family doc because we we often, uh, especially as uh, as a STFM, as Stacy identified, very much an academic organization, a thought that this organization perhaps could be too academic and not practical. And I appreciate the practical focus of this conference, and I'll try to get my comments in that direction very quickly. But uh, so we have a, a front line, a, a solo rural full scope family physician from Kansas who delivers babies, does hospital and ER care, oh, and by the way, is a level three. PCMH, and oh, by the way, is an ONC fellow uh, for her HIT use, and so very much a leader in family medicine. And then the last and probably the most important additional member is a public member, somebody representing patients, and so we have a patient advocate member, uh, uh, Lauren Kennedy, who is the director of advocacy for uh, the National Partnership for Women and Families, and so very much somebody, if we're moving too far from what we think is patient-centered, she brings us back very quickly to what she sees as patient-centered. So these are the strategic efforts that that uh, uh, initiative we'd be working towards, expanding access, and I'm gonna talk some about all, all of these individually, advancing the use of technology, very nice segue that we're using an app for the conference, but we see an opportunity for primary care and particularly the medical home model to take a leadership role in the diffusion of technology out to patients. Uh, I suspect many if not all of you have health-related apps on your smartphones, are wearing a Fitbit like mine that tells me how many steps I've been slugging through today and I didn't get enough yesterday because it was a travel day. Uh, but. Uh, we want to see that techni uh, technology applied in a way that actually can be shown to improve people's health, because otherwise it's just glitzy technology. And so we want to take a leadership role interfacing with, uh, with the tech sector about how do we work together to, to actually develop those things that really are enablers of health, are enablers of communication between the patient and their medical home, rather than just glitzy technology that, that makes money. So actually, um, I'll have an opportunity next month, I'll be at the Consumer Electronics Show, uh, along with another one of our board members, and we're gonna start that dialogue uh, with, uh, with the tech sector. 
Um, a primary care workforce, we see that, as you often do, all the way across the pipeline. You know, getting people who have an interest and an aptitude to primary care practice into medical school, nurturing that interest during their medical school career, having strong uh, residency capacity and, and content to the residency training program, and maintaining people's professional interest and satisfaction during their career. Uh, we all read stuff about uh, physician burnout and we have colleagues dro dropping out of the practice of medicine. If we're losing people out of that end of the pipeline, we're still losing workforce capacity. And we often sort of circle back to this idea of not just the triple aim, but the quadruple aim, and that is of, of, of our professional satisfaction as healthcare providers, all of us, not just physicians, working in that team environment in the medical home model. Uh, we need the healthcare system to align so that we are giving better care, achieving better health, saving cost, but also creating a professional lifestyle and satisfaction that is, is uh, um, nurturing to all of us. And shifting to primary care comprehensive payment, I'm going to talk about that a fair bit because I would argue, and it's a, what we refer to in our, our material, it's a linchpin aspect of this strategy is if we cannot change the payment model, the rest of this will not happen. So as, as I said, a strategic uh, uh, plan uh, as a guide for this, this entity, Family Medicine for America's Health. I'll, I'll pause for just a second. In the original Future of Family Medicine project, some of the, the work tasks were, were doled out to the individual member organizations to implement. It was really felt at this point that we needed to create a separate independent structure uh, that would be responsible for implementing this plan. And so that funding uh, came from those organizations to uh, Family Medicine for America's Health, LLC, uh, set up as a subsidiary of the AAFP. This is very much an effort of the entire family medicine community and all eight of those organizations, but it was most expedient to stand that up as a corporate entity within the AAFP, very similar to how TransferMed is set up within the AAFP, but a similar level of, of autonomy. Um, and we've identified these uh, core strategy and tactics, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll go over those just very briefly in just a moment. Um, and tomorrow, we'll be having actually the first meeting of our tactic teams and some of the members uh, of those tactic teams uh, responsible for implementing these strategic efforts are, are present today. And again, I want to acknowledge and thank STFM for taking this meeting that had previously been planned and yet aligned so well with the strategic uh, implementation of Family Medicine for America's Health, there was just sort of a perfect, perfect Venn diagram overlap of taking this opportunity to meet. Um, and again, this idea that very much we cannot do this alone, it really does involve our colleagues in other specialties and other healthcare disciplines on this idea of working, again, with employers, schools, communities, uh, health plan payers, all those sorts of folks. So there is a journal article. This was uh, uh, published on the day that the uh, campaign launched in uh, October at the uh, AFP uh, Assembly in Washington, D.C., uh, and I would encourage uh, this to you. If you're interested particularly more in the, the genesis of this project, the, uh, some, some look back on the original future of family medicine, some of the research base that was very substantive that informed both the strategic and the communication plan that we're undertaking, um, all of that is uh, outlined in this article in the Annals of Family Medicine from, uh, from October. So these are the seven core strategies uh, that we'll be working on, and I've, I've touched on some of these just in, in, in the comments to this point. We want to show the value of primary care. And so this is both a communication effort, but also it's an effort uh, within ourselves to continue to improve uh, our delivery of primary care so that we're, as, as Stacy said, there's a talk the talk and there's a walk the walk sort of uh, aspect to this. We have to really demonstrate to ourselves um, and to our patients and to the public uh, the value of primary care. We're committed to everyone having an identified medical home. You know, our preference would be that that direct sort of identification would be with a family physician, but really the, the research and, uh, and, and the substance behind our effort is it isn't as important what the specialty of that person is, they, but they need an identified source of primary care, someplace they know that's my, that's my primary care provider, that's who I go to when I have questions and illness and have prevention and wellness issues, that's who I go to. We want to achieve the triple aim. I've talked about that. A very much a commitment to reducing health uh, disparities. Uh, I, I think as healthcare practitioners, um, if we limit our area of focus just to healthcare, we're, we're missing the boat. 
uh, all of you, I think, are very familiar with issues around social determinants of health. And if we're really about health, we need to broaden our perspective and broaden our engagement to the, the public and community level uh, to really work towards health, and again, particularly at reducing disparities. It lead the continued evolution of the patient-centered medical home. These words were carefully chosen. Uh, I'm sure, uh, like, like me, you've interacted with some of our colleagues who aren't yet convinced that this is, in fact, uh, a necessary transformation for their practice, or they think it's what they've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and yet, you know, in, in, in my 30 years of practice, there's been so much change in the science of our medicine. I don't understand why we aren't willing to re-examine our delivery of that health care and our ability to do it more uh, effectively and in a more patient-centered way. So we have some issues about communicating out to our colleagues. We're very much com committed to this being an evidence-based effort, and how we gather the research about the patient-centered medical home and its, and, its, uh, uh, and its successes and perhaps its shortcomings. How do we take people's um, critiques of that model and, and, again, evolve that model to make it better? Well-trained workforce, we really talked about. Again, that's that pipeline and maintaining commitment to high-quality education and continuing professional development. And then moving away for, from fee-for-service as our predominant payment model to what we call a comprehensive uh, primary care payment. So I'll stop and talk about this just for a second. The term comprehensive primary care payment taken from an article by Alan Garrell a couple years ago, I believe in the Society of General Internal Medicine Journal, um, and really talks about um, changing from this model of primary, primarily fee-for-service uh, some care, care management fee that you're all familiar with if you're in a PCMH model, and then a, a quality payment of some time. And, and really shifting more of that to what we would currently call the care management fee. So more of a global payment uh, for primary care services. If, if you think about it, it doesn't make sense that primary care is paid the same way in other specialties. I personally hope to never need the services of an oncologist or a heart surgeon or a neurosurgeon, or a trauma surgeon. I mean, I, well, it's a long list of specialists that I would like to meet at a cocktail party, but never in the examination room. All of us in our lifetime need primary care. We need, we need prevention and wellness. We will all have some sort of minor illness where we need access to care. And if we're lucky enough to live long enough, we're going to have one or more chronic illnesses that we need help managing to maintain our best possible health. And that more is a monthly payment model, in, in our view, where there's a, a monthly payment to support the infrastructure of the medical home, not just a payment to the physician, a payment to the medical home that pays for the services that are provided in the office, but also outside of the office. That electronic and phone communication you do with your patients, that maintenance of registry, those reaching out to people about overdue prevention, wellness, and chronic illness management, those things that you do currently not paid for well in the system, uh, if at all, uh, but that actually do contribute to people's health. The system is trying to catch up. They're trying to allow, you know, as you're probably aware, they're going to start paying this care management fee for post-discharge and stuff. But then you've got to fill out documentation and meet X number of bullet points. By the time you adjudicate that claim, you, you probably got $1.59 out of it. Just give me the money and I will take care of those patients. Uh, and, and we need to cut out some of this administrivia, both because of the professional dissatisfaction, but also it, it, it diverts those dollars from actually taking care of patients. And here's the part that really excites me, and that is, what if your primary mode of payment wasn't, wasn't fee-for-service, and your primary interaction with your electronic health record didn't have to do with just capturing billing data? What if you actually got to focus on capturing important um, metrics for people's uh, prevention and wellness and their chronic illness and, and uh, good communication with them and patient education rather than X number of review system bullet points and this level of medical complexity and decision making. All of that has really taken away uh, from our care of patients. And if we can divorce the, the fee-for-service payment and documentation from pri primary care service delivery, we will go along way towards that fourth leg of the quadruple aim of professional satisfaction. So that's, that's the idea. We, there are some things that still need to be paid for in, in a fee-for-service model. We don't want to disincent people from doing important things in their office, minor procedures. You don't want to think it's in my cap, so I'm just going to send them out to the dermatologist or the gynecologist for this minor procedure, whatever it is. I'm going to get paid for doing that service, and oh, by the way, my patient gets more patient-centered care, and, and economically, both I and the system do better. 
Um, and then we still need some sort of a quality payment. Uh, it needs to be around, um, uh, around typical quality and patient safety measures, about patient experience, and, and I would argue some piece that's uh, about uh, proper utilization of, of resources. I would love to see all this prior authorization crap go away and judge me after the fact about the care I delivered and its efficiency uh, as opposed to putting barriers between me and my patient and the care that I know they need. Uh, I, I, I think most of us would accept that we have a responsibility for those limited healthcare resources and that we take it very seriously and we don't need intrusive mechanisms from payers um, to, to be the mechanism by which unnecessary care is, is avoided. So these are the six tactic teams, and I'll go over them individually in just a minute, but the idea was that these are sort of the major topic areas of work, uh, and there's some of these tactics um, that will cross over. As you might imagine, I was just talking about technology. Well, some of that will be in the technology piece, but it overlaps with payment and probably overlaps with practice redesign as well. So a lot of the work will, it was sort of cross-team work, but these are the six areas of focus. Practice, which again is around the PCMH model and, and practice transformation. Workforce, we talked about a, a, a significant focus on graduate medical education reform and how do we accomplish that. The technology piece, I talked about the patient facing piece. The other piece that we want to be a, a convener for is a voice for, again, not just, not just even primary care, but the broader uh, healthcare community in feeding back to vendors of, of HIT systems, particularly electronic health records, how do we make them more usable? Because I don't care what version number is on the EHR you have, it's 1.0. Um, they, <laughs> uh, it, you know, they, <laughs> and, and they need to hear from us as users of those systems. I, I have a master's degree in informatics. I, I want to do my bit to reach out from the from the uh, practitioner side to the IT geek side, but we've got to find some common ground where we understand the limitations of the technology, but they understand the delivery of healthcare and what things are helpful and which things are intrusive. And you know, they think that when you can make something happen with 12 clicks, well, it, it does it, it just takes 12 clicks. It's like, yeah, but yeah, you and I know. So, <laughs> so research, you know, really two big pieces to the research. Uh, 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 both that we need to expand uh, the knowledge base that goes with primary care research. Our country has a fascination with genomics and robotics and uh, high-tech drugs, and yet we spend too little on those things that you and I take care of every day that really have a much greater impact on people's health in a population base. And then we also need a research piece that really tracks the efforts of this initiative. You know, are, are we succeeding in reducing healthcare disparities? Is the payment model resulting in cost savings and improved healthcare? So there's a real focus there. The payment model, I, I, I talked about a fair bit, but, but obviously that's something unlikely to happen at a national level. Uh, it's really gonna be more local or state and regional, and so very much an effort, and again, the engagement with our AFP chapters. How do we reach out to local payers to get them to understand that they really need to fundamentally change how they pay primary care and, and essentially carve it out from the rest of their uh, care? And a lot of this understanding of this, um, uh, um, comprehensive primary care payment has come from the evolution just over the last few years really picking up of, of direct primary care and how that model has supported uh, primary care practices to be very successful both in their patient-centered delivery but also economically. Anybody here in a DPC practice? No? Okay. So familiar with the model? Okay. So the idea is that the, it is this. It's this per member per month payment. In most models, it's from the patient, but increasingly it's coming from employers or unions. Um, sometimes people make it through their uh, cafeteria plan uh, payment, but a lot of these folks, they contract with a source of primary care and then they have a high deductible plan for those specialists like me that they never want to meet. So the idea is how do we extend that to those of us that are environments that aren't small practices that can't really make that DPC type or direct primary care type of transformation, but bring that sort of payment model to, to other uh, practice environments. Uh, and then engagement. Obviously, we need to engage other audiences in our efforts to move this forward. So it is our colleagues and other health professions and other specialties. Um, it is uh, payers and employers and communities, but it's especially patients. We really feel that we need to engage patients as our advocates in, in redesigning the healthcare system. And, and we're very much 
uh, of a mind that every primary care practice should have some patient feedback mechanism. In a small practice, it might be one person. In a large practice, it might be a you know, patient advisory committee. But not only at the practice level, but how, how effective could we be if we rolled those individual um, um, patient advisory committees at the practice level to a higher organizational level where they together could be a, a, a political advocacy force on our behalf with, with government and with payers to redesign the system in the way not only that we want it to evolve, but in the way that we're going to educate them that is in their best interest as well. So this is the practice team uh, uh, for the, the tactics, um, some of the areas that they're gonna focus on. Um, I don't wanna take all of my time and not leave time for question and answer. What I, what I would do to cue this up, I'm gonna go through each of these six and just leave them up there and not read them to you, is that at a four o'clock special session this afternoon, basically I'm gonna run through each of these six tactic teams along with a couple other of our, our team members. And, and what I really wanna do is use that as a, a basically a large focus group session. You all um, are innovators in practice redesign. Uh, I'm here to hear from you about how do you think based on this outline that we've sort of laid out, where do you think we should put our efforts? What, what have we missed? Um, what's your experience in your practice, your community, that would inform our efforts? And so we will be all ears at that afternoon session at four o'clock in meeting room 11. So uh, sorry for promoting over whoever else has a four o'clock time slot, but, um, <laughs> but very much interested in getting your input. Actually, I have a friend that's talking, then I'm sorry I'm gonna miss his talk, but. So this is the practice team. This is the workforce and education development team. Uh, and again, their focus very much on the content of things that I've already outlined. So five members uh, on each of these teams. I should pause for a second too. The idea is that this is a core team uh, with a, a team leader reporting up to our Family Medicine for America's Health Board, supported by our consultants um, that are helping us with the strategic implementation. But there's gonna be a large virtual network built around these core teams. And this is another um, um, invitation for you as, uh, uh, as folks who have this experience is if some of this really resonates to you in one of these tactic team areas, uh, and particularly around a, a, a particular tactic idea, um, I'll show you how you could express your interest in this, and the teams may reach out to you about um, not having to show up at meetings, but uh, to be on you know, a month or every other month uh, uh, virtual call to sort of gather your information uh, and your input. So workforce and education, the technology uh, team, um, and again, we've talked quite a bit about their area of focus, the research group, leadership role in specific issues, and again, around the PCMH and, and practice redesign, the payment reform group, and again, very much already talked about this, but again, I can't, I can't overemphasize uh, how important changing payment is if we wanna accomplish any of these other things. Uh, and then the engagement team, I'm one of the liaisons to that group, but again, reaching out to our colleagues and, and how do we advocate to, to make these things happen. So, so the uh, other groups with critical roles, um, you know, practicing physicians, other, uh, the eight professional organizations that are involved, their individual members, uh, our chapters I mentioned, very much an interest in reaching out to patient advocacy groups, not just at our practice level, but at the national level, and that's why we have a patient advocate on our board. This boots on the ground physician pra that are actually practicing is I, I can't overemphasize that either. Um, you know, if 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 something that I've said it just you say, gee, that's crazy. That's just never going to work in my community. It would be helpful to hear that. Uh, obviously, around advocacy, other primary care specialties, and and our colleagues in other healthcare disciplines. Um, we are uh, very focused on this idea of team-based practice, uh, about interdisciplinary training, so that people come out of their training with that as their in embedded practice uh, model. Uh, and so we have work to do on that. So how is this different um, uh, from, from any of our previous efforts? You know, I think we've learned a lot uh, from the efforts that we've had before. There is, uh, uh, laid out in the article I showed you, a very strong research base that says, Many people are looking for somebody to step up and take a leadership role in changing our healthcare system, and most of them are looking to family medicine and primary care to do it. 
there's, there's a, a definite perceived uh, window of opportunity, and it's open right now, but it's not going to stay open for very long. Uh, you know, we've all heard about demands of uh, the ACA implementation about more people that haven't had primary care services access coming into the system, the triple aim. We really have learned from, uh, again, from previous efforts, you know, what tactics and strategies are effective and what's not, so we've learned from that. And the last thing I emphasize is this family medicine nice. We, we are no longer going to be reluctant to stand up for the changes we need to see in our healthcare system that advantage primary care just because to some people it might seem self-serving. You know, what I've outlined for you is what all kinds of health services research would tell you would result in a more cost-effective, more equitable, higher quality healthcare system. And just because it happens to advantage primary care doesn't mean that we, in our usual humble, self-effacing way, shouldn't stand up and boldly say these things. And we will no longer be afraid to do that. So the, the public facing communication strategy, I, sh I should back up again, so much to finish, just get into such a little amount of time. Um, we have a three year plan communication strategy um, and that's branded as health is primary and that's an, an intentional play on word uh, about health but primary care uh, and I'll show you some of the content of that in a minute. Uh, and then uh, this is a three year plan and the idea again is to raise this awareness in all of the stakeholder groups we've just talked about, uh, about the importance and the fundamental value of primary care so that they understand and are open to the strategic efforts that we'll be undertaking. And then that strategic plan is planned for five years. When we were growing up, medicine meant our family doctor. When we were sick, had a broken bone, or got hurt, that's where we went. The technology was simpler then, but our doctors took care of us and helped us stay healthy. Things changed over time. We changed, and healthcare started to change too. Scientific advancements made medicines and treatment better, but the healthcare system got more complicated. We started spending a lot more money, but all that investment didn't make people healthier. Healthcare started to feel a little disjointed and impersonal. Now everybody is talking about reform and the system. It's gotten pretty loud, but nobody's really talking about health, good health. Isn't that really what we all want? Our country has the best doctors, the best hospitals, and the most innovative scientists. Shouldn't we be healthy? Somewhere we lost our way. We forgot what matters. We need to embrace the values that make people healthy, like a long-term relationship with a trusted doctor, someone who knows us, our family, and our risk factors, someone we can connect with when we need them, who uses the latest technology, someone who can help us stay healthy, and when we're sick, help us get the most from the healthcare system, someone who can see the big picture and the small one. That's what the best healthcare should be, a system based on primary care that can make our advanced medical system work for real people. We know how to get there, and going there now can give us a system that works for everyone and makes us healthy again. Now is the time. Together, let's make America a place where health is primary. Thank you. So this video launched at our, our uh, communications uh, launch uh, in October. Uh, these are some of the ads uh, that were around Washington, D.C. at the time, uh, and a lot of them are highlighted in this handout, this uh, red uh, uh, handout that some of you have already picked up, and it's out on the table uh, out in the registration area. Uh, and so the idea is that this is just launching. The idea is that it will uh, involve uh, uh, some planned city tours where we'll go uh, to different cities and highlight uh, success stories in those communities where, again, uh, primary care, employers, uh, public, uh, um, public health, whoever have sort of come together and have a success story to share that the rest of us could learn from so that we sort of extend that best practice and, and highlight how primary care is really integral to that happening. Uh, and again, more just uh, about how that aligns with the triple aim, uh, and again, that's in that handout piece. So this is the campaign launch. Uh, with our, uh, our alignment with the Triple Aim, we were really fortunate to have uh, Don Berwick uh, uh, with us, who uh, sort of, uh, uh, he and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement responsible for this concept of, of the Triple Aim. Uh, he was uh, very supportive of our efforts and very um, um, 
very kind in his support, but also a, a challenge to us about how, you know, we have, uh, he thought the five-year window was of our strategic effort was probably about right, because if we don't fix this in five years, the government's going to come down hard and do, it, do this transformation in a way that probably isn't as functional uh, and primary care friendly uh, as we would want it to be. Uh, and then also T.R. Reed, this idea of the, the city tour, or sort of national comparison, very much uh, like his uh, Healing of America book in 2009, where he talks about other healthcare systems, uh, and he did a PBS documentary that talks about uh, different uh, communities and their success. But he's absolutely convinced that in all of the success stories he's seen of, of higher quality, more patient-centered, lower cost systems, that it's really based on primary care. And his comments also very supportive to the efforts that I just laid out. So we did get some pickup. I'm going to just go through these. We did get a reasonable amount of, of uh, uh, sort of pickup of our, our message. But this is one of those things. We weren't in it for a big splash and run. This is something that we're going to build on over time. Uh, but there were some uh, uh, blogs, things. You've probably seen there was an article in Family Practice News and one in uh, uh, Medical Economics about this. So these are the things coming up. Uh, we're going to highlight uh, some topics that are really primary care centric, like nutrition and exercise, chronic disease management, immunizations, those sort of things coming up. So watch for those. Um, and again, the city tour idea. Uh, and the first one is plan planned for Raleigh, North Carolina in, towards the end of February. So yep, there they are. Those are the places we're going this year. This is another place where uh, I'll show you some contact information soon. If you feel like your practice, your community, your state has a great story to tell that we all could learn from, I would encourage you to bring that information forward and let us you know, consider how we do that. We also do eventually plan together a, put together a toolkit so that uh, folks could do some of this on their own in their own community um, uh, you know, based on their own story. Stories are so powerful. So this is that sign-up information. Two websites, the healthisprimary.org is, is pretty much the more patient-facing, uh, uh, has this video, and uh, the, the posters that I've showed you is, is really sort of where we plan to build this patient engagement uh, as, as far as its electronic platform. The FMA Health, Family Medicine for America's Health, uh, is more the professional strategy <laughs> sort of site. Uh, we've got a Twitter handle and a Facebook page because everybody does. and. Uh, but this, uh, no, actually, we're really, I don't mean to make light of it, we're really listening through those tools. So I, I very much encourage you to do that. Um, and so there's a Dropbox, info at fmahealth.org. So if you have feedback, please send it there. If you are interested in your community or your practice, you know, having some of these resources available or potentially, uh, you know, being a city tour site, send it there. If you are interested in being on this sort of more virtual network supporting on the tactic teams uh, and, you know, have a, a particular expertise aligning with one of these areas, send it there because we very much want to hear from you. So with that, I'm going to close and use my remaining time for questions, but I would say, again, if, if that 4 o'clock time works for you, that's where we really would have a, a good opportunity to have a dialogue and hear from you in these six tactic areas. What do you think we should be focusing on? What experience do you have that could inform us? Uh, but for right now, in the time we have remaining, I just uh, entertain your, your questions and do my best to answer them uh, about what we've talked about so far. So thank you very much for your attention.